All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hold on just a second. All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with today's webinar. So we'll start with an introduction of Zycel. It's, I believe, one slide in uh, size here for you. This horrible animation that's tied into the slide that I need to remove. Um, so who we are. So maybe you haven't heard of us. Maybe you're a new reseller. Maybe you're joining us here on Facebook. Um, so we make computer networking equipment. We've been doing this for 30 years now. We got our start all the way back in 1989. So I'm going to have to update that slide to 31 years. Um, we're a global business. We operate and sell our products in 150 different markets. Um, we've got a little over 1,500 associates worldwide. Our U.S. headquarters is located in Anaheim, California. That's our warehouse, marketing, sales, and our tech support. We do not farm out our tech support overseas um, or to third parties. Um, we've got a little over 100 million devices deployed out there in the field. So while we might not be a household name, we have been doing this for a while, and a lot of people are relying on our equipment for networking. So onwards to today's webinar, Wireless 101. So we'll start talking about some of the big players in Wi-Fi. You'll see these names around here um, a lot. So IEEE, that's where we get 802.11b, g, and whatever from. Um, the IEEE is a working industry working group. The um, collection of engineers from different universities, people involved with the different chipset and hardware manufacturers, basically they all come together in the IEEE group and they create the standards in which everything is based on. This includes not just wireless technology, but all your wired standards, things like that. There's even, an, I believe, an IEEE standard out there for uh, transporting um, tapes from one location to another um, via a station wagon. So lots of different standards out there. Um, the Wi-Fi Alliance, this is primarily a group made up of the uh, sellers, us, Netgear, you know, the, the big names you see. Um, and the idea behind the Wi-Fi Alliance is to market Wi-Fi and to try to make Wi-Fi um, usage as smooth as possible. They primarily do that by trying to fill in some of the gaps on the IEEE rules to make sure everybody's equipment talks to everyone else. So, you know, no matter how many years these spend nailing out the details of these specs, there's always aspects of the final standard that are open to interpretation. So the Wi-Fi Alliance tries to provide the definitive uh, reading of those rules and how to implement them and then make sure everybody's equipment works with everyone else's equipment. Um, you'll generally see consumer equipment that's Wi-Fi Alliance certified. You see it much less often in the business stuff. Um, and then the FCC, federal government, they're the ones here that set the rules, what channels we can use, what power output we can use, antenna versus radio power uh, ratios, things like that. Um, so the, they're the big bad boys out there when it comes to enforcing the rules and setting the rules. Um, not always so great at uh, actually um, enforcing those rules, um, but we try to follow those rules and be in full compliance on all of our equipment. So we'll move on to talking about radio waves. So um, Wi-Fi is based on radio. Basically, any device with Wi-Fi has a little chip in there and a little antenna that sends out radio waves. No different than, you know, walkie-talkie or a cordless phone or something like that. Um, so just in general, as frequency goes up, um, the more data that you can cram into those waves. Um, but also, as frequency goes up, the range shrinks. So for you old-timers out there like me who have been uh, using wireless technology for a while, you might remember back in the early days of your cordless home phone, you know, you could get on that phone, you could walk outside, you could walk down the block and still maintain a decent uh, connection for that call. Um, those were the old 900 megahertz phones. Then around the 90s, he started switching to 2.4 gigahertz phones. Um, and the, the big marketing pitch was, hey, the sound quality is better because it's a higher frequency, it's easier to cram more audio data onto those waves and give you better quality. But you might have noticed the range was nowhere near as good as your 900 megahertz phone. You, you know, maybe it would work in the backyard, maybe it would work in the front yard, but you aren't walking down the block anymore um, talking on the phone. Then from there, they moved to 5 gigahertz phones, and again, the big pitch was, hey, even better sound quality, 
but you might have noticed that now you can't use them outside at all or in some of your bigger houses out there, your McMansions, you know, maybe you couldn't use them in all corners of your house and have a good quality phone call. Because again, as the frequency goes up, range goes down. And you'll notice that with 5G, the new 5G technology, the, the big push for 5G and all the speeds you'll see advertised, you know, oh, download a movie in 10 seconds type stuff are using, um, I believe, 60 gigahertz waves. So works great if you're outdoors and close to that base station. is isn't going to work inside your house or inside a building. So if you need to download that movie in 10 seconds, you're probably going to need to walk outside. Um, so when it comes to radio waves, the FCC requires you have a license to use those waves. And they have various rules around that. So um, in the names of uh, consumer usage, um, they've opened up some small frequency which doesn't require a license to use it. So that's the 900 megahertz band, 2.4, and their 5 gigahertz products. Um, so that, that's basically what we're using, and that is shared amongst all wireless devices. So anything that is cordless or wireless, from a mouse um, to your Bluetooth headset to your video game controllers, they're all using one of those three bands of frequency. Um, and part of the rules with this is as a... Uh, Unlicensed spectrum, no license required. You have to share and play nicely with everyone else. So there's rules in place about how interference works and the fact that you can't go in technically and interfere with someone else's signal. Um, so that comes in for Wi-Fi. You know, a lot of Wi-Fi access points, including our own, have various protections to help you with what are called rogue APs, access points an employee or a third party might have plugged in um, that you don't want there. Um, and they have the ability to contain those and block those. In the U.S., technically doing that is going to put you afoul of FCC rules and can get you a big fine. Um, so we don't promote those features here that much in the U.S., although you do still see it being promoted even though it's technically illegal to use those features. Okay, onwards, we measure power. Um, I know generally when talking to consumers, we talk about milliwatts, 200 milliwatt, 500 milliwatt, etc. Generally, though, when you're looking at data sheets and talking to people in the industry, we use dBm instead. Um, so with dBm, for every 3 dB increase in power, you're essentially doubling it. So 20 dBm gets you 100 milliwatts of power. Increasing that to 23 doubles that power in milliwatts to 200, 200 milliwatts. And the reason we do this partially for dB is because it makes it easier to add different things together when you're measuring everything in dB. So uh, things which don't have output power, such as antennas or amplifiers, we can add those in to the radio output power and get you a pretty good approximate of what the real output power is in milliwatts um, when you convert from dBm to milliwatts. The other reason for this is um, Wi-Fi range. As you increase power, it's similar to sound waves. Um, it drops off real fast. It's, I want to say it's an inverse square, but that's, it's not technically. Um, we'll get to the formula here on another slide. Um, but just in general, dBm is going to give you a much better idea of what your performance range is, right? So if you go from 100 to 200 milliwatts, you go, oh, wow, I've doubled my range. Then it's actually much, much smaller than that. So 20 to 23 is a much more um, better visual representation, if you will, um, or analogy, if you will, to what sort of gain you can expect to see in the real world as you increase power. Um, so when we're talking about Wi-Fi, one of the things that tends to be ignored a lot is your signal-to-noise ratio. Basically, the strength of the signal you want to listen to versus all the other noise using that same frequency at that time. Um, so a good way to think about this is if you're talking to somebody, um, right? If me and you are sitting here in this conference room talking to each other, we don't have to talk too loudly. We can hear each other because there's no other noise coming in unless we've got these doors open. Um, but you go out to a bar and you're having that same conversation at that same distance, because of all the other background noise, it's going to be ha harder to hear each other. So you're going to want to boost your signal, the, voice, the volume of your voice, to be able to hear each other better. And then continuing that analogy on, move out to a nightclub where you've got loud music blaring. You know, you might be having to shout directly into each other's ears to be able to hear each other. It's the same sort of thing. Um, you know, the signal is versus the sound of the noise around it is, is too weak for you to hear without having to get louder or closer, or both. And signal-to-noise ratio really is determining your throughput. So a lot of people just look at the receive sensitivity, how, how strong is that signal I'm receiving, but really it's the signal-to-noise ratio 
that really defines the speeds and the quality of your connection, more, much more so than the raw um, signal strength situation. Um, the, other, the other term you'll see used a lot is attenuation. How much is that signal degraded, whether due to distance or due to um, obstructions and being absorbed by things in the environment? So we've got a little slide here for you. Up at the top there, that is telling you how to calculate basically your range for your wireless device. So you see that um, free space, so it's assuming you're in open air. Um, signal loss, you can see it's a logarithmic function, um, plus some other stuff in there. It's a pain in the ass to calculate, but if you really wanted to, that's the formula you use to calculate the theoretical range you can get. Um, and then we've just got some common things in there. So a glass window will give you a 3 dB approximately loss in your signal. So it's about a 50% of the output power is going to be dropped just going through a glass window. If you've got a tinted window with some sort of metal reflective thing on there to keep out heat or to keep out uh, UV, you know, you're, you're almost, you're going to double that. So, so now you're, you're taking another 50% off your signal strength in theory. And just some of the other stuff on there showing you just how much a wall in theory can uh, take off and degrade that signal or attenuate it. So now we'll talk about range a little bit more here. So Wi-Fi range is going to be a combination of your signal strength, your signal to noise ratio, your attenuation, the frequencies being used. Um, so you have to combine all that together. So, you know, this is probably the most common question we get. What's the range on your access points? Um, it, it, there is so many factors that go into determining your range um, that it's really hard to give you a number. Um, and in general, it doesn't matter which AP you're talking about, we're going to give you the same ballpark range. I think we generally tell people, um, you know, 300 feet indoors, 1,000 feet indoors. I think that's what our sales guys are using these days. Um, but, but that's just because there, there's no way for us to really know. So that's just some round numbers we've, we've put together and throw out there. Um, another thing that tends to get overlooked is that Wi-Fi range or Wi-Fi communication is two-way communication. So your range is generally going to be determined by the weakest member of the link. So we'll go back again to the analogy of two people talking to each other. Um, if I'm, I'm talking to Try and I've got you know my normal voice here, um, my voice is going to carry a certain amount of distance. But if Try, for instance, has laryngitis and he can't speak at the same level I can, then we're going to have to be able to move closer together to be able to hear and have a conversation. So it's the same thing with Wi-Fi. Everything you're doing with TCP, even if you're streaming a movie, which is in theory download, right? It's the, the signal coming into the phone and the data that's coming into the phone. But the, the phone still needs to be able to reply back and say, hey, you know, I've, I've received those packets or, hey, wait a minute, something happened to those packets. Can you retransmit them? So, you know, even in that scenario where in theory most of the communication is from an access point to the client device, the client device still does need to provide the ability to talk back. So, you know, a typical access point these days is 500 milliwatts or a watt or in some cases up to four watts. So your access point is able to send that signal really far. So in our analogy of two people talking, your access point is shouting. It may even be shouting into a bullhorn. But you have to also figure out what is it talking to and can it hear when that device tries to talk back to it. So, you know, an iPhone only has about 25 milliwatts of output power. Um, I think it's what, 16 dB? 12 dB, something like that. Um, so the point is, it, you know, if you've only got 25 milliwatts coming out of your phone, then you're going to have to be fairly close to that access point to be able to maintain two-way communication, even though the signal might be, in theory, you might be able to pick that signal up across the block from where you're at. So it's something else to keep in mind when you're planning out your deployments. So this, this, this slide here is showing you sort of how RF behaves. So radio waves are just that, they're waves. A good analogy to this is a pond. You know, throw a rock into the pond and watch the way the ripples radiate out. It's very similar to Wi-Fi behavior. Um, and if you've done this in a man-made pond where there's like a concrete wall, you might notice the waves hit that wall and bounce off. Same thing happens here with Wi-Fi. We call that reflection. We also have something called scattering where it based on a bumpy thing, so instead of a wall, maybe a wall of rocks in a, in a pond um, where the waves will reflect off in multiple different directions as they hit 
the, the different shapes that they're bouncing off of. It can wrap around solid objects a little bit. So a bunch of stuff's going on with that, those RF signals that we're sending out. We'll, we'll call back to this a little bit later. Last thing, and this is probably the biggest mistake when it came to the original Wi-Fi specs, which unfortunately we've been building off of ever since, is that um, there is no coordination between the different devices um, who gets to communicate. Now with radio waves, it's just like back in the old days of your walkie-talkies, only one device can transmit at a time. If two or more devices transmit at the same time, those signals can cancel each other out or they essentially raise the noise floor to the point where it, you can't tell who you're supposed to be listening to versus um, who you're supposed to be ignoring. So if you've ever done that on the old school non-digital walkie-talkies, your old analog walkie-talkies, when you two or more people try to talk, you, it's just a mess. It's the same thing with Wi-Fi. So the way around that that they originally came up with was um, basically a device listens to see if anyone else is communicating, and if they don't see anybody else broadcasting, then it says, okay, I can broadcast. If they see someone else is broadcasting, there's a little random number generator which determines how long the device waits before checking to see if it can transmit again. Works really well back in the old days when you weren't sending that much data. The data you were sending was um, bursty, so you were, you'd send in brief bursts, you know, like browsing a web page. A web page is generally bursty, right? You load the page, there's a bunch of data transfer for a few seconds, then as you read the page, there's no real data transfer going on. Um, so it's fine for those environments, and then f it's fine in environments where you've only got a handful of devices communicating. But what happens if you're doing something like a VoIP call or video stream? Well, then you're, you're constantly broadcasting. So how do the other devices that aren't streaming, how do they get airtime without causing interference, right? So they've got to try to guess as to um, when there's going to be brief pauses in that stream um, that they can then jump in on. The other problem you run into with this is something here we call the hidden node problem. So in this example, we've got two laptops here, right? We've got one over here, one over here. Um, both of them are within range of this central access point. So they can both see the access point. The access point can communicate with both of them. But the problem is this yellow circle here is their signal strength. So it's, this laptop can send the signal to the access point. But when this guy over here listens to see if anyone else is broadcasting, it cannot hear this, uh, this, uh, this client device over on the right-hand side. So it'll think it's clear to broadcast. It will broadcast. And now the access point is hearing a signal from both. So it ends up dropping the packets from both and no data ends up being sent. Uh, so that's what we call the hidden node problem. The fact that, you know, this reliance on listening before you can broadcast doesn't help if you can't hear everybody who might be broadcasting. All right, so the next thing to talk about here is data rate versus throughput. Um, there's a lot of words out there that are used to describe how much data you can send or be transmitted. Um, and people get confused by this because they'll buy an access point and says, hey, this access point is a 300N product, it can transmit 300 megabits per second. However, when someone goes and runs a speed test.net or some other speed test from their laptop or their phone, they'll go, hey, wait a minute, this thing's only giving me 100 megs of speed. Those bastards, they lied to me about the speed. So the IEEE spec and the way the industry has standard on, standardized on talking about speed is we focus on what I'm gonna call today the data rate. So the data rate is the total amount of data that is transmitted between the two client devices. So in most cases, that would be, um, for instance, your laptop and the access point or your home router. What is the maximum amount of speed? Um, you'll also sometimes see this referred to as the link rate or the phi speed, the physical rate. Um, so those include not only the data that you're wanting to send from your laptop to say the access point and then onward out to the internet or to your local network, but it includes all of the protocol overhead, you know, which includes all the error checking, retransmissions, et cetera, et cetera. And remember, when we're dealing with Wi-Fi, we're dealing with a really noisy environment where we've got multiple devices trying to talk to each other. There's other sources of RF interference and noise floor and things like that. So what happens is we've had to build a lot of error checking and retransmits and things like this into the protocol itself. And in most cases, a rough rule of thumb is about 
half of the data being sent between your client device and the access point is protocol-based communication. So what people are generally excuse me, measuring is throughput. Um, and again, these terms are interchangeable. I'm just using them the way they're most commonly referred to. So if you're checking an Amazon review, you'll see this all the time. Hey, I went to speedtest.net and the speed so poor. Um, so again, what people are normally measuring is what I'm going to call throughput. So it's going to be the amount of data sent from a certain application out to your remote site. So what you're not, you're not seeing is you're not seeing all this additional protocol overhead. You're only seeing the data you yourself are wanting to send. So generally, you're look, talking 50 to 60% below the actual data rate, which is the industry standard for how to communicate the speeds of your wireless device. And this, this dates all the way back to Ethernet. You know, on Ethernet, protocol overheads are very, very small. So that's where they kind of standardized, here's, here's how you measure your data rate, here's how you talk about speed. And unfortunately, you know, with newer standards such as Wi-Fi, Powerline, G.HN, Mocha, things like that, where you're in these noisy, rough environments, the protocol eats up an enormous amount of overhead um, out there. So just keep that in mind. That's why you're seeing less speeds, and that's before we even talk about things like, you know, the quality of the signal, the signal-to-noise ratio, your distance between you and the device, and other things which might slow down the signal above and beyond um, the data rate. So it leads us to our next question here. How do I um, increase my speed? So we'll talk about how we do it in the industry. I mean, not you in general, but how, how the industry itself has tried to speed things up. So one of the ways we've done that is encoding. So 802.11n used 64-bit QAM. It's our encoding standard. Um, basically how much data we're cramming in there. With 11AC, we jumped up to the ability to use 256 QAM. And now with Wi-Fi 6, we're talking 1,024-bit QAM. So one of the questions we get is, well, why, why was 11N only 64-bit? Why didn't we just jump to 256 or 1,024? And it just has to come down with uh, the balance of needing a CPU that's fast enough to do this encoding and also energy efficient, right? We're talking about wireless devices. So we not only need the horsepower to do this, this more detailed encoding, we need to be able to do it efficiently so we're not killing the battery of our mobile device. Um, so that's why you, you, the QAM has only slowly been increasing and why we didn't jump to higher levels of QAM earlier in the history here. The other way of doing this is by increasing our spatial streams. And we'll talk a little bit more about what spatial streams are and how they work in a future slide here. The other way of doing it was just increasing bandwidth. 802.11b, 802.11g are using 20 megahertz of signal. Um, to boost the speeds for 802.11n and some of the proprietary G plus stuff back in the day, um, they doubled the bandwidth, 40 megahertz. So you double your speed because you're doubling the amount of radio bandwidth that you're using to send your data. 11ac jumped that up to 80 megahertz. And um, with the Wave 2 11AC, that jumped up to 160 megahertz. So we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so here's an area where people get confused. When you go into your 2.4 radio, you will see 11 channels to choose from here in North America. If you're in Europe, you'll see 13 channels to choose from. Um, the trick is those channels are what? Five, five megahertz, I think, in size? But the 802.11b, G, et cetera, minimum channel size for Wi-Fi is 20 megahertz. So when you choose channel one, you're actually causing interference with channels two and three. If you choose channel six, you're getting interference from channels four and five and seven and eight. So in North America, using 20 megahertz channels, you've only got three channels that can be used by every device out there. Um, before you start getting interference. So if you're in an apartment building or in an office scenario where there's more than three access points or wireless routers, you will have interference between each other. Now, I mentioned before we doubled the speed to 40, 40 uh, megahertz channels um, with 802.11ac and, uh, or excuse me, with 802.11n. So if you're talking a 40 megahertz channel, um, you're now basically only got one device which can operate at 40 megahertz. This total spectrum from 1 to 11 and a little bit of overlap over here and here, this whole thing is only 60 megahertz in size. 
So if you've got a device using a 40 megahertz channel, that means there's no other device that can also use a 40 megahertz channel without causing interference. And because of band edge issues, you're generally using this middle 40 megahertz, which only leaves 10 megahertz on either side for other devices to use without causing interference. So 40 megahertz, a real world scenario, isn't really usable for you out there. So that was why there was a big move with 802.11ac to move people to these dual band uh, access points and radios, right? Where let's move everything to the five gigahertz band. Whoops. Um, so why did we do that? And the answer is you've got a lot of channels here to choose from. I think it's like 24, 26 channels that don't interfere with each other. So these are your 20 megahertz channels, right? So that in theory, you've got a ton of devices you can have plugged in, turned on, operating in the five gigahertz spectrum, and they won't be interfering with each other. But you'll notice there's this orange section here and there's this yellow section here. So what, what's going on there? So these are what we call DFS channels, dynamic frequency selection channels, I believe is what that uh, abbreviation is for. Um, basically, that big chunk of middle spectrum here, this is being used by the military, the government, and by radar. Um, so the rule is if you want to use these channels that are in this middle orange and yellow section, you have to support something called DFS. And basically what it does is it listens and if it detects um, radio, radar um, or other government usage of this spectrum, your access point has to basically shut down for 30 minutes to make sure that that frequency is clear and is not causing interference with the radar for the local weather department, the radar at your local airport, et cetera. So there's a couple problems with that. One of them is obviously people don't want their Wi-Fi to shut off at random times because the access point detects somebody else is using that spectrum. Um, the other problem is it can add up to six months to your certification for FCC certification for sale in the U.S. So for this reason and just the cost involved in the testing, a lot of consumer equipment isn't certified to operate in these DFS channels. So we run into this all the time where someone calls us and says, hey, calls our tech support and says, hey, we've deployed our network and for some reason, Bob's cell phone and Jill's tablet aren't able to connect to the network. What's wrong? Why aren't you guys compatible with their equipment? And what generally happens is, is they've deployed at least some of their access points using these DFS channels. And that cell phone, that tablet, or consumer-grade equipment, they have not been certified to use DFS channels, so they, they just won't connect. Um, so that's where the problem comes in. So we'll have to say, nope, you can only use this little green section here or this little green section here, or else it's not going to work. And we've ran into some Apple equipment, which doesn't play friendly with all the uh, channels over here. And they only seem to want to work with the channels over here. So be aware of that as well. Okay, so that's DFS. So the next thing we talked about is increasing bandwidth to increase our speeds. So we saw um, jump up to 40 megahertz channels. So if you jump up to 40 megahertz channels and you decide you don't want to mess with these DFS channels, well, now you've only got four channels that you can use before there's going to be interference. And then we talked with 11AC, the big way that they increased the advertised speeds was to go up to 80 megahertz channels. So again, now if you're using 80 megahertz channels to get the maximum speed, now you can only have two devices in the general area operating before you're going to have interference. So in an office or an apartment building, that's, that's pretty much guaranteed. Um, so you know, how, how usable and how important are those 80 megahertz channels? We've essentially doubled the advertised speed, but are you really able to use those channels without causing interference and how much is that interference gonna degrade things? And then the big jump was um, with Wave 2, 802.11ac equipment was, hey, 160 megahertz channels. We've doubled the speed again. Well, those have to operate in the DFS uh, spectrum. They can only be used in these two blocks here. Those overlap with DFS. So again, a lot of your consumer equipment, a lot of your cheaper or more inexpensive uh, mobile devices aren't going to support those channels at all. So be aware. Um, spatial streams now. Let's talk about what are spatial streams. Um, so what happens here is we used to have this thing we call multipath. Now remember before, you know, we're broadcasting this circle of waves, it radiates out, and then it hits different objects, and then 
bounces or reflects off of them. So the problem we, we have out in the real world is because of those reflections, you get what's essentially an echo, just like if you were to shout into a canyon or something like that. And if you you might notice that you know your echo comes back two or three times, you know depending on the shape and distances. It's the same thing with a radio signal. What happens is you send out a little bit of data. It can go directly here. It's a nice short path. So we'll we'll just pretend here. It takes one second. Because it's the shortest path. But then it, we also send that signal out. It hits this piece of office furniture and then reflects here. Well, this path, because it goes here first and then comes here, is a little bit longer than this path. So now you've got an echo which comes in at maybe 1.1 seconds. You've got another signal here which bounces off the floor or the wall, whatever that might be, and then bounces up here. So it's even longer than this path. So now you've got the signal coming in, the same exact signal with three additional echoes, each coming in slightly offput from each other. So this is what we called multipath, and this was the bane of 802.11b and 802.11g back in the day. It was how do you deal with these echoes? How do you figure out which is the raw data you want versus an echo? So with 802.11ac, um, and in some ways in 802.11n, we introduce these things called spatial streams. Basically, some people that are much smarter than myself figured out, A, how to determine what's the signal you care about versus an echo. But then they figured out, well, wait a minute. If we know what the echo is, we can simultaneously send data using different paths. So each echo path is a different spatial stream. So we can send data off this antenna and send data on this antenna at the exact same time and use this technology to determine what is an echo um, to basically send different data and determine, hey, I've got two different streams of data. So by using spatial streams, each spatial stream, stream can contain different amounts of data. So um, you basically, for each spatial stream, um, double the amount of data that you're sending versus one spatial stream, right? So someone else also came along and said, um, so that's what we call MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. Someone else came along and said, hey, you know what? Rather than taking and sending 150 megabits here and 150 megabits on this stream and combining them together to 300 megabits overall speed, our access points can support four streams or five streams or more, but a lot of your wireless client devices can only support one stream or two streams. So what we can do instead is use these spatial streams to simultaneously send different data to two or more client devices. So each spatial stream can go, in theory, to a different client device. So we're still sending 300 megabits of data, but it's 150 megabits for this guy here, different 150 megabits for this guy here. So we call that Moo MIMO. And with 802.11ac, uh, we can send this as um, spatial streams letting the access point send different spatial streams to the clients. However, the clients still have to take turns as to what only one device can send back. So when you're looking at business class access, or when you're looking at consumer class access points, you'll normally see them advertised as like AC2600, AC3200, where they, they combine the different data rates together, maximum data rates theoretically across both radios and say that's our speed. When you look at business equipment, you generally see them advertised based on the spatial streams they support. So you'll see two by two or three by three. So that's telling you, you can transmit two spatial streams, you can receive two spatial streams. You can transmit three spatial streams, you can receive three spatial streams. And sometimes you'll see that this is different. You might see uh, two by three. So it can only transmit two spatial streams, but it can listen to three spatial streams back. So it's really common in a lot of your client devices, your laptops, your phones, your tablets, to have them have a mismatch between how many they can transmit and how many they can receive. If you're looking at primarily Cisco equipment, you'll see four by four, hey, four spatial streams, but then you'll see this colon here with the number three or two after it. So what does that mean? Um, basically, it's telling you that in theory, um, You've got four antennas that can listen to four spatial streams. However, the chip can only handle three at a time. So it's, it's kind of a more of a marketing gimmick. There, there's some technical reasons why you might do this, but realistically, a four by four colon three is basically the same thing as a three by three. So combine all of that together. You'll see here we've got this little table. You've got your spatial streams here, 
your modulation type here, and then your different bandwidth um, utilization. So you can see what effect it has on speed. So we'll take the simplest one here, one spatial stream, maximum 256 qualm. You can see here if you're using a 160 megahertz channel, you will see that product advertised as supporting a 866 megabit per second speed. And that'll generally be rounded up to 900, right? So it'll be an AC 900. Um, if you use only an 80 megahertz channel, it drops to 433. And if you're using a realistically a 40 megahertz channel, the max speed you're going to see here is only 200 megabit through speed. Then you throw in what we were talking about before the protocol overhead, so you'll be lucky to get 100 megs actual throughput if you're measuring it with something like speedtest.net. So the wonderful, confusing, complicated world of Wi-Fi speeds. So the other common question we get was, well, Sean, how many devices can I get on this access point? Access point A says it supports 256. Access point B says it supports 1,000. Why am I not buying the 1,000? And the answer is because real world, those numbers you see on those data sheets for maximum number of clients are make-believe. You'll never hit them. You'll never see them. And I'll try to explain why. Generally, the limit on the number of client devices that you can have is determined by two things, and it's completely device agnostic. It's going to be determined by the type of data you are sending. Is it bursty traffic? Is it uh, a stream? And if it's a stream, how, um, how well can you buffer that? And then just how many devices you have trying to send that data or send some sort of data onto your network. Um, so it doesn't matter which access point it is, whether we're talking about a $50 consumer access point or we are talking about a uh, $1,000 business class, high-end AP. Um, the spec numbers they say for number of client devices means nothing. It's all going to be on the protocol, the speed that you can achieve, and then the type and number of users that are on that uh, operating at the same time. So to try to explain this here, we've got uh, a theoretical example for you. So we've got an access point here. This access point supports three spatial streams, so something like one of our uh, WAC 6503D-S or uh, WAC 6103 or uh, NAP203, NAP303, so it's a three by three access point. And for this particular simulation, we're using um, speed quality uh, or uh, signal strength of negative 67 dBm, five gigahertz radio, 20 megahertz channel. So in our first example here, we've got 34, where we're simulating the, um, a three megabit stream. So somebody that's watching a uh, HD, low-end HD Netflix stream, for instance. So in that scenario, what we see here is we can have 34 laptops because these support three spatial streams. So 34 laptops can operate on that access point, um, no issues, um, with that three megabit stream. Take that same scenario and switch them over to a tablet where the only thing that has changed here is the number of spatial streams supported. This tablet only supports two spatial streams. You'll see here we went from 34 devices streaming three megabits per second to now we can only fit 21 devices on that same access point streaming the exact same traffic with all of the same uh, theoretical signal strength and quality measurements. So the aggregated throughput across all of those devices is only 65 megabits, where before, with three spatial streams, it was an aggregated 100 megabits. Now we go to an inexpensive Android smartphone, older Apple iPhones, which only support one spatial stream. Still, everything else is the same. You can now only fit 10 devices on that access point with those three megabit stream before you run into issues. Nothing changed on the access point, nothing changed on the type of data. In this scenario, all we did is change the number of spatial streams. So now in the real world, you're mixing and matching different spatial streams, you're mixing and matching different types of traffic and speeds, um, you're, you're mixing and matching different data rates between each of these devices and signal strengths. So um, in the real world here, that's going to be your limiting factor, not however many client devices are advertised on the data sheet. Um, so now we'll move on here. Oops, I'm missing a slide. 
I was going to ask you a bunch of questions and then say the answer is co-channel interference. So let's talk about co-channel interference. So co-channel interference is what we call it when you've got more than one device operating on the same wireless channel. As we talked about before, each device in theory, only one device can transmit at a time. They all have to take turns doing that. And as we talked about before, um, you know, you run into this hidden node problem where some devices can see each other, some devices can't, so you end up with devices talking at the same time causing interference. Um, it could just be distance, it could be other sources of RF noise that don't follow the Wi-Fi rules, Bluetooth, cordless devices, microwaves, RF interference put out by industrial equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That all is your co-channel interference, which, excuse me, screws up your signal to noise ratio. So traditionally, the way you dealt with this is you spent a bunch of time plotting out, here's where I'm putting access point one, here's where I'm putting out access point two, and then carefully choosing which channel you wanted to operate on. But the new wider, you know, 40, 80, 160 megahertz channels make that basically impossible to do. Um, so the way you would deal with that is you would turn the power down, right? You'd shrink the power coming out of the access points. As we mentioned earlier, Wi-Fi is two-way communication and your client devices are generally much weaker than your signal than the, for, than the signal coming from your access point. So you turn down the power on your access point so it's not shooting the signal as far. So you reduce your co-channel interference, which is great, absolutely works. The problem is you've now lowered your signal to noise ratio. Most traffic is primarily speed focused on from the access point to the client device, not the other way. You're generally downloading to your phone or your tablet or your laptop, not uploading from it. Um, so now you've lowered your signal to noise ratio on the receive end, so you've still lowered the speed. It's just now the speed isn't being lowered due to co-channel interference, it's being lowered due to lower signal to noise ratio. So the solution to this really is something called smart antennas. So we've got them, um, Ruckus has them. Um, Ruckus is probably who you're most familiar with since they're the biggest name when it comes to smart antennas. We've been doing it just nearly as long. So basically the difference is your traditional access point that mounts up on a ceiling has a sort of round coverage pattern. That's where the signal goes. If you've got a directional wall mount antenna, it focuses the signal in a very specific range, and that's what you've got when you've deployed it. So smart antenna does something a little bit different. Your smart antenna AP has the ability to choose from hundreds and hundreds of different antenna patterns. So instead of one fixed pattern like you had here, you've got hundreds and hundreds of antenna patterns to choose from. Our algorithm looks at two things. It looks at where that client is in relation to the X point, so we can focus the signal to them to give them the strongest signal possible. We also look at other sources of RF interference, whether they're industrial noise or other access points operating on the same or neighboring channels. And we then choose a signal pattern that helps us focus where we're shooting the signal to, but that antenna pattern also determines where we're listening for a signal to come in from. So we won't hear this signal coming in from, in this case, a microwave. This works with any client device. It doesn't require the client device also have similar technology. It also works with moving client devices. So we will change that antenna pattern in real time based on where the client device is moving to. So it's a fantastic technology out there. So here's a real world test scenario that we came up with. This would be a, an apartment scenario or a, a hotel scenario. In this case, this is a real world hotel um, that we did our testing in. And this is following the current modern trend of putting one access point in each room, one low powered access point in each room instead of putting one in the hall and then trying to shoot it you know, through walls and pipes and bathroom fixtures. Um, this is the new trend we're seeing in most of your mid-tier mid and higher uh, Wi-Fi deployments. So each AP has um, two different de client devices that each support two uh, spatial streams. And you can see we've staggered the channels that we're using out there. So in this scenario here, this floor, we've got one AP using channel 100, and this floor below it, we've got another AP over here and another AP over here using it. So we run our tests here. We chose two devices. We chose our NWA1302, which has smart antenna, and we chose the Ubiquiti UAP ACIW. Um, it's a similar product in price. It's a similar product in 
features, signal strength, RF characteristics. So when we have one AP functioning, we run our tests here, and what do we see? We see that both of us are basically the same performance. Ubiquity, in fact, you know, beat us by two megabits per second. Um, in channel utilization, so in theory, the maximum uh, usage of the airtime on that channel was 67% across both devices. We now turn on a second AP and rerun the same test. And what you'll notice here is with two APs, our combined aggregated throughput is almost 800 megabits. Ubiquity is only 555 megabits per second. So why is that? And it's because we can maximize our channel utilization because we're using smart antenna. Um, the ability of the access point to ignore interfering signals that aren't coming from the client they want to talk to. So with the ubiquity, they maximize across both APs, the airtime utilization is at 95%. So 95% of the time, one or more devices is transmitting. With a smart antenna device, we're able to get to 131% of the theoretical maximum. Why? Again, because the access points are able to ignore signals that are being sent um, from other devices that it doesn't want to listen to, it allows multiple devices to transmit at the same time without canceling each other out. So we can get to more than the theoretical maximum throughput and airtime utilization. So now we do the same thing with three access points. Same sort of thing here, the aggregated throughput is even higher, over 900 megabits. And the airtime utilization goes up from the 130s to 155%, where you see Ubiquiti's airtime utilization with three APs actually goes down. Why? Because they're stepping on each other's toes, and as we talked about before, there is no coordination of who gets to broadcast. You just have to trust a random number generator to determine how long to wait before checking again. The other thing I really want to draw your attention to here um, is look at the, how the bandwidth being used is distributed. You'll notice each access point is getting about 300 megs of throughput. Look at ubiquity. And I'm not picking on ubiquity. This is going to be true of anybody who's not using a smart antenna that's been tweaked to pay attention to co-channel interference. Um, you'll notice that it's really random. This AP gets almost 300. This AP only gets 80 megabits. This one gets 178. So it's really spread out and random. Whereas with smart antenna, it's really predictable as to how much bandwidth each AP is going to get. And we'll go back here real quick. It was the same thing with two, right? They're both about the same. Whereas again, with ubiquity, one is getting a, a lopsided amount of that airtime and the bandwidth. So that, that concludes what I'm talking about here when it comes to smart antenna and how smart antenna helps you out in the real world. Um, if you care, we've got a white paper which talks a little bit about it. We've also got links to a third party who did um, co-channel interference testing and other testing with smart antennas, both ours and Ruckus. Um, and they compared us with uh, Aruba and uh, Cisco. Um, which don't have smart antenna. So you can check that out. We've got a link directly to their uh, networking disk, all the tests that we've done, as well as a summary of the you know, stuff that really applies to us. Okay, so now let's talk about where do I mount my access points. So the majority of non-smart antenna access points are designed to be mounted on a ceiling. They've got sort of a round coverage uh, uh, antenna pattern that's designed to be centrally located above the client devices. If you mount that access point on a wall, it ends up shooting a bunch of your signal up into the floor and ceiling um, and doesn't really give you much horizontal coverage. So generally, mounting a ceiling-designed antenna onto a wall gets you poor coverage and poorer performance than if you had a device um, that's designed to be mounted on a wall. Where am I going with this? Um, we do have a series of access points that have something we call dual optimized antenna. We allow you to switch between a ceiling mount antenna pattern and a wall mount antenna pattern based on where you deploy that device to optimize for that. And then if you're using smart antenna, it really doesn't matter. The smart antenna will find the appropriate antenna pattern for each client, regardless of where it's mounted. Um, some other tips here is generally you're trying to mount an access point as high as possible within reason. Um, and the idea behind this is you're trying to minimize the number of obstructions between your client device and your access point. So in this scenario here, you can see 
by mounting it on the ceiling, the signal is able to go pretty much line of sight from the client device to the access point without having to penetrate people or cubicle walls and things like that. So generally, mount them on the ceiling. <coughs> so what we see in the real world is a lot of people like to mount these onto their drop ceiling so it's hanging down and everyone can see it. Um, I mean, you can do that, no, nothing wrong there, but there's also no problem with mounting it above a drop ceiling. Your typical drop ceiling uh, material is basically cardboard. Um, very little degradation or attenuation of the signal. Um, so rather than, you know, trying to mount it and poke holes in your, whoops, poke holes in your drop ceiling and running a cable out and finding the T-bar mounting brackets and things like that, just lay them on top of the, uh, on top of the drop ceiling. Um, works just almost just as well. You don't have to poke any holes anywhere. There's no wires or anything like that. Um, in general, you don't want to mount them on the physical ceiling above the drop ceiling up here because you've generally got, you know, metal conduit, you've got air conditioning vents and things like that run through there. Metal will attenuate the signal and reflect the signal, so you generally don't want it all the way up on the actual ceiling where all that metal nastiness is. Hotel strategy, the, the way that it had been done for the longest time possible was what we call umbrella coverage, right? You mount it in a wall or in a hallway, and then it provides coverage from, to anywhere from four to 16 rooms shooting that signal through walls, through pipes, through fixtures, through furniture, um, and basically it doesn't work. Um, now that you know every room's got two, three, four devices that people are not just browsing a web, they're wanting to stream video on YouTube, Netflix, et cetera, um, the signal quality just isn't good enough, it's not reliable enough, it's not predictable enough. So the biggest trend that we are seeing is moving to a situation where you use lower powered access points and you put one in each room or one in every other room. Creates a much better guest experience, a lot less complaints, a lot less tech support, a lot less angry hotel owners calling you up because their guests are unhappy. Uh, so we're seeing this in all pretty much mid-tier and higher hotels um, going, going forward. Some things to keep in mind is guests will steal those access points. Um, so if you're using a mount, use a mount that's not easily uh, Remove, so a locking mount, one where how to unlock it isn't obvious. Most of our mounts are that way. Um, we also see people mounting the access points behind furniture, underneath a desk, things like that. And on our hotel designed access points, we do have the ability to do that with the default included uh, mounting brackets. Another thing to not overlook here is um, uh, when mounting these access points, turn off the LEDs, so make sure you're getting an access point that you can turn off the LEDs, because no one wants to try to sleep in a room where there's some green or orange blinking light directly above their hotel bed or wherever it happens to be in that room. Um, when we start talking about public areas, um, you know, you need to take into consideration not only the, the physical area that needs to be covered, but what sort of user density you're expecting. The more users, the more access points you need. Um, use something like load balancing and client steering to help make sure um, access points don't get overloaded. Um, and generally, you want to provide different areas their own coverage. So a lobby should have its own dedicated access points separate from the hotel bar or the pool or whatever. Um, smart antenna really shines in these environments. Uh, so really heavily consider using smart antenna-based products in hotels. Um, schools questions you're going to want to ask is how many students per room, how many of those students are expected to be connected to the Wi-Fi in the room. Um, so, you know, a lot of classrooms, they're, they're not using their tablets or their Chromebooks um, in, in all the classrooms. They might only be using it in their, you know, they might not use it in their social studies classroom, but they might be using it in their, their uh, math room. And the other thing is, you know, how smart is the content? Are they streaming video? Is the teacher pushing video to those devices? Um, if they're just, you know, browsing the web to do research or do it, turning in their homework assignments, you can get away with more users per access point versus a situation where the teacher is pushing video content and streaming to every single student at the same time. In those situations, you will need more access points. You may even need two access points on a per room basis. It, it just depends. 
In general, though, the teachers and students should be VLAN'd off and on their own separate SSIDs and VLANs. General rule of thumb is once, if it's a smart classroom um, where you're going to have 20 students or more um, connected, you probably want to have two APs in the room. Um, and if you're doing 30 or more students in a room, you really need to have smart antenna on those access points. Okay, so that's it for that. We'll talk a little bit about Wi-Fi 6. I know this is dry material, guys. We're almost done. Stick with me here. Um, so Wi-Fi wi 6 has also most commonly been called to and previously been referred to as 802.11ax. Wi-Fi 6 is part of a rebranding done by the Wi-Fi Alliance. So um, the current 802.11ac is Wi-Fi 5. Wi-Fi 6 is 802.11ax. You may also be, see this called or referred to as high efficiency wireless. So unlike 11ac, the improvements in 802.11ax are going to apply to both your 2.4 and your 5 gigahertz radios. In theory here, it's going to dramatically improve throughput in high density environments. Um, in theory, you're getting over double the speed at the same connected data rate. Um, so how are we doing that? Where are we getting the speeds? You know, we've bumped up the QAM like we talked about before from 256 to 1024. We've added something here called OFDMA. So OFDMA allows your access point to allocate sound, or excuse me, time for each individual device. So you're no longer, um, you know, relying on a random number generator. You're no longer relying on clients to be able to hear each other before determining to broadcast. The AP will schedule and let them know, hey, your time's coming up. This is when it's your turn to broadcast. So it becomes much more efficient for us. We have something here called um, Uplink at MooMimo. So before we talked about using spatial streams for the access point to send data to multiple clients. Well, now multiple clients can transmit data at the same time using Uplink MooMimo. Um, we have what we call spatial frequency re reuse. We have something out there um, called, uh, what is it called? color coding of data. So it lets a client device or an access point color code and put this little extra bit on their signal um, so you know which access point you're trying to communicate with. So other access points operating um, can know, wait a minute, that person broadcasting isn't for me um, and ignore that data. So it helps you with the code channel interference, especially in office environments where you have multiple floors or multiple offices sharing um, a floor. Um, and it allows with Wi-Fi 6 in theory um, to help coordinate and reduce co-channel interference without smart antenna and without needing to manage um, your neighbor's access points. So it's really cool. A lot of improvements. It's essentially throwing out and solving all of the problems that have persisted since 802.11b all the way through 11c and solving our biggest issues. So Wi-Fi 6 is going to be fantastic. So some interesting things here to know. First off, Wi-Fi 6 certification just began, I think, in the end of October. Um, so devices that came before that weren't Wi-Fi 6 certified. Another interesting thing to keep in mind is the actual standard hasn't been ratified yet. The IEEE group, the group that makes the standard, um, is currently looking and scheduling um, the working group or working copy approval isn't scheduled till September 2020. And final approval isn't expected until November 2020. So that means everything that's out there is not based on the final spec because the final spec doesn't exist. It's based on a draft spec. Um, and a really important thing here is a lot of the products that shipped with Wi-Fi 6 that are marketing themselves as Wi-Fi 6 don't support and never will support the key features that make Wi-Fi 6 Wi-Fi 6. It's kind of like AT&T advertising 5G and then putting a little E after it that you hope you don't notice because um, they're rebranding their LTE product as 5G when it's not. It's, it's, it's newer LTE. Same sort of thing is going on where you've seen people rush out product, the market is Wi-Fi 6, but it's missing those key features that make Wi-Fi 6 as desirable as it is. So I've got a slide here. There's basically two major vendors of chipsets right now for Wi-Fi 6, Qualcomm and Broadcom. Um, I've got a slide here for the Qualcomm. Broadcom is almost exactly the same. So the first gens of chip for Qualcomm don't support 
upstream OFDMA, which is really important to have. They don't support upstream MUMIMO. And they don't support TWT, and they don't support BSS color coding. These are the key things that differentiate Wi-Fi 6 from 802.11ac. They are missing on that first generation of chip, and they cannot be upgraded to it. Same thing goes with Broadcom. So the Qualcomm Gen 2 chips didn't start shipping until September, and most product that uses them didn't start shipping until October or November of this year or are not shipping yet. Same goes for Broadcom. Broadcom was a little bit faster. Broadcom got their Gen 2 chipsets. I believe they started shipping them to manufacturers in August. So the takeaway is, is if a product came out last year, if a product came out this July and calls itself Wi-Fi 6, it's using a Gen 1 chipset and it's missing those features that make Wi-Fi 6 Wi-Fi 6. Um, so, so keep that in mind. Obviously, if you're shipping and selling a product that's Gen 1 chipset, you aren't highlighting the fact that you're missing these key features um, and never will get them. The last thing I will say on Wi-Fi 6 is even with people that are using the Gen 2 chipset, many of these features are not going to be supported um, out of the box. These will be added later via firmware. I believe Qualcomm's schedule is by June or July of this year that their SDK will support all of the key Wi-Fi 6 features. The other thing also to keep in mind is many of these features to use them have to be supported by the client device. So come June or July, your Wi-Fi 6 access points that are using Gen 2 chipsets should support all of the important features, but you still may not have any clients that support all of those features. Those generally client support for a lot of these advanced features trails by anywhere from 12 to 18 months behind um, the access point chipsets. And that's just a power issue. Again, the first gens and the first versions of these chips that support all these features have two problems. One, they're physically large. Two, they tend to eat up a lot of power. So it takes them a year or two years to optimize the mobile chipsets that go in the clients to be small enough to fit and to use a small amount of power so they don't eat up your battery. So, so keep that in mind. So Wi-Fi 6, you're not going to see all the benefits for probably at least two years from now, if not longer, um, out there in the field. So that concludes today's Q&A. Um, so let me know any questions. Again, use that question and answer box. Type them in. I will try to answer them for you. I do want to call attention that we do have user forums at forum.zicel.com. Um, you can go there if you've got a non-important question, you've got some feedback for us, you've got some ideas, you can go there and post your ideas. Um, unlike some of our other competitors who have user forums, our user forums are monitored by our uh, R&D team and our engineers. Um, so you can post a question in there and you might get an answer back from an engineer or a software coder who actually uh, deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you've got general feedback for us on this presentation or you've got suggestions for different webinars, trainings, things like that that you'd like to see us put together, you can email me directly or reach out to your sales team. Um, and with that, that's, that's the end of today's presentation. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you come out, coming out. Um, do send us feedback. I'm not seeing any questions coming in. Um, so if you're typing up a question, do me a favor. Highlight that question, copy it, paste it into Notepad or an email, and just send it to me as an email, um, and I can answer it that way for you. Um, but since nothing has been sent in at this point, I'm going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today.